You're watching East Asia tonight. But first, some key developments outside the region in Myanmar. State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi and uh, President Win Min have been moved out of jail and placed in undisclosed locations. An army spokesperson says the move was prompted by heat wave in prison and their old age. And this comes as the Myanmar military struggles with various internal challenges, including border security near Thailand and China. Well, ethnic armies near the border with China launched an offensive against the military last October. And Chinese officials have since brokered a truce among the warring parties. Observers say the attacks caught the Myanmar army by surprise. Military forces were weakened, resulting in defeats and surrenders in parts of Shan State. But the violence also spilled over to China in the early months. Artillery shells had killed and injured Chinese citizens near the Myanmar border. And it prompted Beijing to, on several occasions, call Myanmar out over the violence. China also took steps to facilitate talks and a truce among the warring factions. And uh, to help us unpack this topic, we have two experts uh, with us. Amara Tiha is a researcher from the Peace Research Institute, Oslo. Now, Amara's expertise uh, includes Myanmar's peace process. And we're also joined by Dr. Brian Wong. He's an assistant uh, professor in philosophy and fellow at the Center on Contemporary China and the World at the University of Hong Kong. But just before we uh, deep dive into this topic, let's look at a recap of Operation 1027. These are retaliation shots fired by the Myanmar army. At 4 a.m. on October 27, a group of ethnic armies launched coordinated attacks against the Myanmar military. That marked the start of Operation 1027. The offensive was launched by the Brotherhood Alliance, a coalition made up of three ethnic armed groups in Myanmar. The Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army, or MNDAA, based in Kokang Shan State, the TNLA, or Ta'ang National Liberation Army, whose headquarters is in Namshan Shan State, and Arakan Army, headquartered in Kachin State. The joint rebel forces launched simultaneous attacks. They targeted the Myanmar Army and its police force in northern Shan State, which borders China. Another ethnic armed group attacked military-run offices in Kajin State. Days later, Kachin State was targeted. Sigaing, Chin, Magui, Kaya and Rakhine also saw escalating clashes following Operation 1027. The Brotherhood groups seized significant territory in northern Shan State. The Brotherhood Alliance issued a statement to explain its attacks on the Myanmar army. Among the reasons, to rid of Myanmar army dictatorship and weed out online scam syndicates operating in Myanmar. Various groups which opposed the Myanmar army swiftly backed the attacks. The opposition National Unity Government's civilian troops, known as the People's Defence Force or PDFs, has vowed to fight alongside the Brotherhood Alliance. At the same time, other ethnic armies and rebel groups also stepped up on their attacks on the Myanmar army. The violence spilled over to China on several occasions. Beijing publicly slammed the violence, but it worked behind the scenes to facilitate peace talks. After rounds of dialogues, a ceasefire was reached in mid-December between the Myanmar army and the Brotherhood Alliance. But it was a fragile truce as pockets of fighting continued despite the ceasefire. Oh, I sure have lots to unpack, but uh, let's uh, tackle some of the latest developments. And I want to begin with you first, uh, Amara. The, the shifting uh, of leaders Aung San Suu Kyi and Min Win out of their prison cells. Uh, we've heard the official reasons for that. But in your opinion, what does that uh, tell you about um, the current position the Myanmar army is in? But currently, the, it is a, a bit tricky part. Uh, the political states, status system, status quo. And there are a lot of mediation going on. So there are some news circulated that it was the diplomatic intervention and diplomatic request to meet Aung San Suu Kyi and also the NLD leader. And that is the one reason that they, she was moved to the, another location for upcoming mediation, All, although we cannot you know, independently confirm on this uh, information yet. Right. Uh, Dr. Wong, you know, there have been uh, recently, at least, uh, a lot of high-level meetings between China uh, and Myanmar, including between China's uh, ambassador uh, Chen Hai and the army chief Min Online. Uh, can you just give us your perspective? How likely is China here to have, you know, 
played a role perhaps in Aung San Suu Kyi's move? I think the probability is most certainly there. I mean, China has substantial interests in an expedient resolution of the crisis in Myanmar in virtue of the damage of its on its economic interests, the spillover in terms of border insecurity. And above all, it recognizes that the fragmentation of Myanmar, whilst it certainly keeps the region easier to manage and engage in terms of a, a one-on-one or one-on-group-based uh, model of engagement in modus operandi, it also means it's much harder to pass forward infrastructural deals and trade and investment deals can actually be upheld. And it's clear that Beijing is losing patience and also to some extent faith in the ability of the Tamador to deliver order and security simply in virtue of the ineptitude of the military junta in Myanmar right now. Right. I just want to bring our attention back um, to Operation 1027, which is a large coordinated operation, which isn't sustainable without help. And uh, one observer uh, pointed out where the ethnic armies got their weapons. Let's uh, listen in. We all know that the only way to really gain stability in Myanmar is to stop the internecine warfare. Now, that's 70 years of history of internecine warfare. Stop the guns, stop money, stop that. Very, very hard, very, very difficult. The Golden Triangle, as we all know, uh, is pretty well unpoliceable. And um, so this new town uh, on the Thai border, and I, I think there's evidence that a lot of the, the problems that have occurred inside Myanmar, the so so to speak, is that funding, direction, weapons, et cetera, have always come through Thailand mostly. Well, let's uh, get your uh, view, Dr. Wong. Uh, the, the Myanmar army has, without naming anyone, said that there is foreign intervention in this operation. Uh, what role do you think uh, China played in it? So I most certainly don't think China was actively involved in backing Operation 1027. That was not the case. But they most certainly also were likely to have had foresight and awareness beforehand, given the presence and also proliferation of Chinese intelligence assets in the region. And it was likely that Beijing tacitly condoned, if not indeed lent indirect support in in, uh, to, to, as, as observers, you know, or in facilitating, to some extent, the, the insurgency in parts of the peripheral territories, simply as a way of warning the Tabador that their continued funneling of resources into supporting criminal syndicates, into supporting the cyber scamming operations, would not go unabated. But fundamentally, it's, it's worth noting that Beijing does not want to and has always sought to avoid taking explicit sides. Uh, why do so when you can engage with all sides in the conflict, whether it be in terms of the inter-ethnic or inter-ethnic group strife, or indeed the, the tensions between the NUG and also the military junta regime? So in short, you know, I don't see China as an active player when it comes to the militarization of the conflict, and nor indeed do I see Thailand as being an active facilitator of military violence and escalation in the region, because ultimately the refugee crisis and the problem that Thailand faces on its border is, is rather substantial. Both China and Thailand have different interests, but also convergent interests in brokering some sort of peace in Myanmar, and hence why there's been a lot of proactive efforts on a part of the Thai foreign minister, uh, Kun Pan Pri, and also the Chinese foreign minister, Wang Yi, in engaging with their Myanmese and Myanmarese counterparts over the past couple of months. Well, I hear what you're saying, uh, Dr. Wong, but uh, Amara, from, from Myanmar's point of view, though, it is to a certain extent quite rare, uh, I guess, for China to be so actively involved in facilitating all these ceasefires among the warring factions. What do you think has changed uh, this time around? I mean, I, I wanted to do not just the facilitation role, but the mediation role in here. The China is now the mediator and has a leverage on all the stakeholders, and because they constructed a good relation with almost all the stakeholders in Myanmar since the, uh, since the coup before. So what they have right now is a different uh, leverage role as they can almost try to convince the regime and also try to able to have some extents of influence to the EROs around the border. And this is also have a kind of view that they is this is sometimes that they can mediate it. So when the China see the conflict in Myanmar, he saw it as a two different tier. The, the conflict within the central authority and the conflict within the center and the peripheral. So based on this you know, two-tier approach, the way that they mediate is also two different ways. For the center, uh, center relation, uh, 
he considered is a conflict between the NLD and the uh, military. And from the central peripheral, this is where they try to find the status quo for quite a while. But they are now seeking the new architectural model that we're working on. I think uh, this is a Chinese model when they see the Myanmar from the Myanmar perspective. All right. So despite the China broker truce, there are still pockets of fighting along the border. And uh, earlier we asked Dr. Digby, a China observer, on what Beijing's priorities are in relation to Myanmar. So let's uh, take another listen. China, of course, is looking to, for the least friction possible. That's really what China wants. And they want it to be stable, as stable as possible. Uh, and I don't think that the Chinese government is actively supporting any uh, activities against the government, that's for sure. But I don't think that they're giving uh, as much support as they might have given before. I think there are some doubts about how to proceed. So, uh, Amar, again, we heard from uh, Dr. Digby there that China wants stability, but there is no ceasefire uh, for all the parties. So how do you think Beijing is going to read, read this gesture? I mean, are they, um, you know, can the Myanmar army and the ethnic armies afford to provoke uh, China by, by not following with the call to have the ceasefire? I mean, the, the, this is a two-part, you know, it's wonderful that China don't have a full hegemony or full influence on all the stakeholders. At the same time, they have a more hegemony and more influence than any other stakeholder. This is a, one of the interesting part. Another part is, you know, there are a lot of Chinese investment in the Western part. So China need a status quo stabilized, not only to protect the interests, but also putting the bar, uh, filling the gap that will create a borough vacuum where the external actors, the Western actors are coming in. So this is where, you know, mediation in Myanmar is not just about the status quo, but it's a kind of strategic interest for China to keeping the area within the own architecture of the peace process. This is somehow the Chinese are getting in, not just about the protecting of the economic interest, but it's a kind of strategic interest for the longer term. Right. And uh, finally, I've got a question uh, to both of you. We'll start with uh, Dr. Wong first. Uh, now, China is one of Myanmar's strongest allies. It appears to have connections with the key players, uh, the Myanmar military, the, the ethnic army, civilian national unity government, as well as Ms. Suu Kyi's uh, National League for Democracy Party. Um, so how do you see China tapping on this leverage in, in resolving the ongoing uh, crisis? Very quickly, uh, Dr. Wong first. I think the key, you know, question and prerequisite for successful mediation is the role of ASEAN in the coordination between China and ASEAN. As important as China is with its economic presence and trade and investment flows, the fact that of the matter here is that the, the Myanmarese military, the Tamador, has enjoyed long-standing ties with its high military. And there are also many conduits and channels for not just communication, or resource transfer, but also implicit pressure to be applied through and via near Thailand. And under the new administration in Bangkok, we've seen clearly a more proactive diplomatic approach and a willingness to play a more neutral role as a mediator and a peacemaker on a part of the Thai administration. So if China wants to bring peace to the region, it needs to get the key stakeholders, including Thailand, but also the rest of ASEAN on board, as opposed to coming across as a unilateralist power, moving and trying to make um, make and support powers or, or indeed influence and shape uh, the domestic politicking within Myanmar uh, in a unilateral set. So that's a key priority for China. And secondly, it's it's also imperative that Beijing applies sufficient pressure on Tamador to get it to come to the table. At the moment, I don't think the, the, the military sees much need in complying with ceasefire agreements, which it has flagrantly violated over the past couple of months, uh, despite the best efforts of China. So the question here is what's the stick? And I suppose to some extent, you know, the crackdown on the cross-border criminal syndicates was indeed a stick and a show of strength by the Chinese uh, security forces. But what exactly are the next steps there? We can only wait and see uh, before we can find out. Yeah. And uh, Amar, if you want to jump in quickly here. I think there is no one size fits all strategy for Myanmar issue for China right now. I think, as I mentioned, you know, different tier have a different priority. So I, for the central administration, China is not engaging all stakeholders to mediate between NLB and other political parties and the SAC, that's the one part. And for the northern groups along the China border, China will try to find the status quo with the interests of EROs around the border. And there is no clear strategy yet, but the high likelihood is you no, know, China will start creating a political process and dialogue based on the ERO proposal. This is where the FBNCC, the WSA-led 
a coalition proposal called Meet on the Key. But on, on the southern part, you know, China, of course, need to engage with the ASEAN and Thailand, and then they will have the, another strategy that we are probably going to see in upcoming months that may be the, another refreshing version of the Trek 1.5 that we saw in previous few months ago. I think there will be the three different strategies that will go coordinately, and then China will coordinate all these three processes together. All right, thanks so very much for your time and thoughts, uh, Amara and Dr. Wong.